Section 4 of Astounding Stories 18, June 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Fournier, Centerville, Virginia, USA. Chapter 3 A Night of Horror. The meal consisted of various fruits, some meat which Bentley could not identify, and wild honey which was delicious. The bread tasted queer, but was distinctly edible. The castaways ate ravenously, but even as he ate, Bentley noticed that Ellen's face was chalky pale, and that in spite of a distinct effort of will, she simply had to look at intervals toward the great beast in the cage. Caleb Barter sat with his back to the animal. Bentley sat at the left of the old scientist, Ellen Estabrook at his right. The great beast was quiet now, but he squatted within his prison and his red-rimmed eyes swerved from one person to the other in the room with a peculiar intentness. "'I would swear that beast can almost read our thoughts,' ejaculated Bentley at last, after he had somewhat sated his appetite. Barter smiled with those two red lips of his. "'He can, almost. You'd be surprised to know how nearly human the great apes are, and how nearly human this particular one is ah what do you mean this particular one asked bentley curiously he doesn't look any different to me from the others i've seen except that he is far and away the largest i don't see why you should be so curious said barter testily it's none of your business you know yet what do you mean demanded bentley nettled by barter's tone lee hush said ellen "'Professor Barter is not on trial for any crime.' Bentley looked at her in hurt surprise, inclined to be angry with her for the tone she was taking, but he saw such a look of appeal in her eyes that he choked back the words that rushed to his lips for utterance. He was decidedly on edge, more, he felt, than he should have been despite what they had gone through. When their eyes met, he saw her glance quickly toward the ape, and noted a frown of worry between her brows. Bentley glanced at the ape. The brute now was staring at the girl in a way that made Bentley's flesh crawl. It was preposterous, of course, but he had the feeling, something which seemed to flow out of that mighty cage like some evil emanation from a dank tarn, that the ape knew the girl's sex, and that he desired her. It was horrible in the extreme to contemplate, yet Bentley knew when he glanced swiftly at the girl that she had sensed the same thing, and was fighting to keep the natural horror she felt at such a ghastly thought from being noticeable. It was absurd. The ape was a prisoner, but— Professor Barter, said Bentley, you're accustomed to being with this brute, but it isn't so nice for us, especially for Miss Estabrook, Barter now frowned angrily. My dear Bentley— he said, with that odd testiness which he had assumed toward Bentley before. I refuse to have any interference with my experiment. This is part of it. You mean, began Bentley, I mean that I'm training that ape. I call him man-ape. To behave like human beings. How better can he learn than by watching our behavior? Just the same said Bentley. I don't like it. It's all right, Lee, said Ellen quickly. I don't mind. But Bentley knew that it wasn't all right, and that she did mind, terribly. Barter finished eating. Bentley had noticed that despite the long years he had been a virtual hermit, Barter ate as fastidiously as he probably had done when he had lived among his own kind. He pushed back his chair with a swift movement. Instantly, the roaring of Manape rang through the room. The great brute rose to his full height and grasped the bars of his cage, shaking them with savage fury. He glared at his master, and bestial rage glittered from his red-rimmed eyes. He was a horrible sight. Ellen Estabrook, with no apology, stepped around the table and crouched wide-eyed in the arm of Lee Bentley. Lee, she said, I'm terribly afraid. I almost wish we had trusted ourselves in the jungle. I'll look out for you, he whispered, as Barter turned his attention to the great ape. 
But Bentley was watching the animal. So was Barter. The eyes of the scientist were shining like coals of fire. For the moment, he appeared to have forgotten his guests. It was a success, he cried. As far as it goes, I mean. What did Barter mean? Seeking some answer to the enigma, Bentley studied the ape anew. Now he was positive of another thing. Manape was scarcely concerned with Barter, whom he appeared to hate with an utterly satanic hatred. His beady eyes were staring at Bentley instead. The brute is jealous of me, thought Bentley. Good God, what does it mean anyway? Barter turned back to them, and all at once became the genial host. "'Shall we return to the other room?' he asked politely. It was a relief to the castaways to put that awful room behind them. Barter closed and barred the door with deliberate slowness. Why had this old man shut himself away from civilization like this? How long had he held this great ape in captivity? What was the purpose of it? What experiment was he performing?' What part of it had the castaways been witnessing that they had not recognized? Bentley, recalling the distinct impression that the ape had stared at Ellen almost with the eyes of a lustful man, and had even appeared to be jealous of him because the girl had gone into his arms, Bentley felt a shiver of revulsion course through him as it struck him now how human the regard and the jealousy of the creature had been. He felt like clutching at the girl and racing with her into the hazards of the jungle. But he remembered the anthropoids out there, and Barter's peculiar domination of the brutes. Barter was now watching the two with interest, studying them in turn speculatively, unmindful of the impertinence of his studious regard and silence. "'I have it,' he said. "'Will you two be good enough to excuse me? You will need rest, I am sure. I am going away for a little time.' But I shall return shortly after dark. Make yourselves at home. But remember, don't enter that room. You need not worry, said Bentley grimly. I sincerely hope we take our next meal in some other room. Barter laughed and passed out of the door without a backward glance. From the jungle immediately afterward came the drumming of the great apes, and now and again the laughter of Barter, high-pitched at first, but dying away as Barter apparently moved off into the jungle. Ellen, said Bentley quickly, I don't know what's going on here, but I'm sure it's something sinister and awful. Let's take a look at our rooms. If there isn't a door between them which can be left open, then you'll have to spend the night in my room while I remain awake on guard. I was thinking the same thing, Lee, she whispered. This place gives me the horrors. Barter's association with the apes is a terrible thing. Hand in hand they stepped to the door Barter had designated as that of Ellen Estabrook's. Bentley opened it cautiously, heaving a sigh of relief to find it empty. He scarcely knew what he had expected. There was a connecting door between the two rooms, open, and they peered into the chamber Bentley was to occupy. Back they came to her room, to stand before a window which gave on to a shadowed little clearing in the rear of the cabin. Look, whispered Ellen. There was a single mound of earth, with a white cross set over it, on which there was a single word, Mangor. It might have been a word in some native dialect. It might have been some native's name. It might have been anything, but whatever it was, it added to the sinister atmosphere which seemed to hang like an evil mist over the home of Caleb Barter. That settles it, Ellen, he said. You'll spend the night in my room. Ellen retired to Bentley's room, closing the door which led to the adjoining room, and Bentley walked back and forth in the reception room, waiting for Barter to return. When darkness fell, he lighted the lamps he had previously located. Their odor caused him to guess that the fuel they used was some sort of animal fat. In the strange glow of the lamps, his shadow on the walls, as he walked to and fro, was grotesque, terrible, and at times a grim reminder of the great apes. It caused him to consider how, after all, human beings were akin to gorillas and chimpanzees. Somehow, now, it was a horrible thought. The night wore on, and Bentley's stride became faster. Now and again he peered into the girl's room. 
She was sleeping the sleep of utter exhaustion, and he did not waken her. Bentley felt it was near midnight when Barter returned, his return heralded by a strange commotion in the clearing and the frightful drumming of the great apes, or at least one great ape. Bentley shuddered as the animal behind the locked door answered the drumming challenge with a drumming thunder of his own. Barter came in, and Bentley accosted him at once. "'See here, Barter,' he began. "'I don't like it here. There's something strange going on in this clearing. Miss Estabrook and I wish to leave immediately in the morning. And that grave behind the cabin. Who, or what is it?' Barter studied the almost trembling Bentley for all of a minute. "'That grave?' he said at last with silken softness. "'It's the grave of a jungle savage. He died in the interest of science. As for you, you'll leave here when I bid you, and not before, understand? I've a guardian outside that would tear both of you limb from limb.' But Bentley caught and held fast to certain words the scientist had spoken. "'The savage died in the interest of science?' he said. "'What do you mean?' Barter smiled his red-lipped smile. "'I took the savage and Manape, who wasn't called Manape then, and administered an anesthetic of my own invention. You've heard that I was a master of trefining. No matter if you haven't heard. The whole world will know soon. While the native and the ape were under anesthesia, I transferred their brains.' I put the black man's brain into the skull pan of the ape, and the ape's brain in that of the savage. The ape lived, and he is man-ape. The savage, with the ape's brain, died, and I buried him in that grave you asked about. With a cry of horror, Bentley turned and fled from Barter, as though the man had been his satanic majesty himself. He entered the room with Ellen and barred the door behind him. He likewise barred the door which led to that other room. Now in total darkness, it was all he could do from clamoring on the bed where Ellen slept, and begging her to touch him, anything, if only to prove to him that there still were sane creatures left in a mad world. Outside Barter laughed. "'Oh, Bentley,' he called after a long interval of silence, "'do you like the odor of violets? Good night, and—' pleasant dreams. What had Barter meant? Again, assuring himself that the connecting door could not be opened if anything or anybody tried to enter that way, Bentley flung himself down before the door, which gave on the reception room. He had no intention of sleeping. But in spite of himself he dozed off, though he fought against sleep with all his will. Strange, but as he gradually slipped away into unconsciousness, he was cognizant of the odor of violets, like invisible tentacles which reached through the very door and wrapped themselves gently about him. His last conscious thought was of man-ape, the ape with the brain of a jungle savage. But in spite of the vague feeling of horror, he could not fight off the desire for sleep. Chapter 4 Grim Awakening Bentley returned to consciousness with a dull headache. He rose to a sitting posture and looked dully about him. Dim-wittedly, he tried to recall all that had passed since he had last been awake. He knew he had gone to sleep under the door in the room where Ellen had slept. Yet he was not there now. He peered about him. He recognized the room. Yonder was the table where they had eaten last night, or yesterday afternoon. Yonder was the bed he guessed Barter customarily used, and he shuddered a little as he fancied a man sleeping in the same room with that ghastly travesty which was neither ape nor human, man-ape. The creature's name was simple, being simply man and ape joined together to fit the creature perfectly, too perfectly. Barter's bed had been slept in, but Barter was nowhere to be seen. Where was he? How came Bentley in this room? Barter had forbidden him to enter the place at all, on any pretext whatever. Had he walked in his sleep, drawn by some freak of his subconscious mind into the room of Manape? Slowly, afraid to look, yet forced by something outside himself, he turned his eyes toward the corner where the beast's cage was. The cage was empty. The door of it was open. 
stunned by his discovery. Wondering what had happened during the night, Bentley looked about him. He noticed the long, narrow table at the end of the cage, and the white covering it bore. He recognized it instantly as an operating table, and wondered afresh, where was Barter? Bentley raised his voice to shout the scientist's name. But before he could himself recognize the syllables of the scientist's name, through the whole room rang the bellowing challenge of a giant anthropoid ape. Bentley cowered down fearfully and looked around him. Where was the ape that had uttered that frightful noise? The sound had broken in that very room, yet, save for himself, the room was empty. Bentley turned his head as he heard someone fumbling with the door. Barter entered, and his face was a study as his eyes met those of Bentley. Bentley noticed that Barter held that whip in his hand, uncoiled and ready for action. What was this that Barter was saying? I warn you, Bentley, that if anything happens to me, you are doomed. If I am killed, it means a horrible end for you. Bentley tried to answer him, tried to speak, but something appeared to have gone wrong with his vocal cords, so that all that came from his lips was a senseless gibberish that meant nothing at all. He recalled the odor of violets, Barter's enigmatic good-night utterance with reference to violets, and wondered if their odor, stealing into the room where he had gone on guard over Ellen, had had anything to do with paralyzing his powers of speech. I see you haven't discovered Bentley, said Barter, after a moment of searching inspection of Bentley. Look at yourself. Surprised at this puzzling command, Bentley slowly looked down at his chest. It was broad and hairy, huge as a mighty barrel, and his arms hung to the floor. The hands half closed as though they grasped something. Horror held Bentley mute for a moment. Then he raised his eyes to Barter to note that the scientist was smiling and rubbing his hands with immense satisfaction. Bentley started across the floor toward a mirror near Barter's bed. He refused to let his numbed brain dwell upon the instant recognition of his manner of progress. For he moved across the floor with a peculiar rolling gait, aiding his stride with the bent knuckles of his hand pressed against the floor. He fought against the horror that gripped him. He feared to look into the mirror, yet knew that he must. He reached it, reared to his full height, and gazed into the glass, at the reflection of man-ape, the great ape of the cage. Instantly, a murderous fury possessed him. He whirled on Barter to scream out at the man, to beg him to explain what had happened, why this ghastly hallucination gripped him. But all he could do was bellow and smash his mighty chest with his fists so that the sound went crashing out across the jungle, to be answered almost at once by the drumming of other mighty anthropoids outside, beyond the clearing which held the awful cabin of Caleb Barter. He started toward Barter, still bellowing and beating his chest. His one desire was to clutch the scientist and tear him limb from limb and he knew that his mighty arms were capable of ripping the scientist apart as though Barter had been a fly. "'Back, you fool!' snarled Barter. "'Back, I say!' The long lash of the whip cracked like a revolver shot, and the lash curled about the chest and neck of Bentley. It ripped and tore like a hot iron. It struck again and again. Bentley could not stand the awful beating the scientist was giving him. In spite of all his power, he found himself being forced back and back. He stepped into the cage, cowering back against its side. Barter darted in close, shut the door, and fastened it. Then he stood against the bars, grinning. "'Nod your head, if you can understand me, Bentley,' he said. Bentley nodded. "'I told you I would yet prove to the world the greatness of Caleb Barter, said the scientist, and you will bear witness that what I have to tell is true. Would you like to know what I have done? Again, slowly and laboriously, Bentley nodded his shaggy head. Barter grinned. Wonderful, he said. 
You see, you are now man-ape. Yesterday, you had the brain of a black man, and to exchange your brain with man-apes of yesterday would not have served my purpose in the least. So I had to find an ape of more than average intelligence. That's why I spent so much time in the jungle yesterday. I needed a brain to put in the body of Lee Bentley's, an ape's brain. Your body is a healthy one, and I did not think it would die as the savages did. I was right. It is doing splendidly. It would interest you to see how your body behaves with an ape's brain to direct it. Your other self, whom I call Ape Man, is unusually handsome. Miss Estabrook, however, who does not know what has happened, has taken a strange dislike to the other you. Splendid! I shall study reactions at first hand that will astound the world. But remember, whatever your fine brain dictates that you do, don't ever forget that I am the only living person who can put you to rights again. And if I die before that happens, you will continue on till you die as man-ape. Barter stopped there. Bentley stiffened. From the room where he knew Ellen Estabrook to be came her voice, raised high in a shout of fear. Lee, please, I can't understand you. Please don't touch me. Your eyes burn me. Please go away. What in the world has come over you? Bentley listened for the reply of the creature he knew was in the other room with Ellen Estabrook but the answer was a gurgling gibberish that made no sense at all. His own body, directed by the brain of an ape, could not emit speech that Ellen could understand, because the ape could not speak. The ape's vocal cords, which now were Bentley's, were incapable of speech. How, if Barter continued to keep Ellen in ignorance of what had happened, would she ever know the horrible truth and realize the danger that threatened her? Don't worry for the moment, Bentley, said Barter with a smile. I am not yet ready for your other self to go to undue lengths, though I dislike intensely to leave the marks of my whip on that handsome body of yours. Barter slipped from the room. Bentley listened, amazed at the clarity with which he heard every vagrant little sound, until he remembered again that his hearing was that of a jungle beast until he knew that Barter had entered that other room. Then came the crackling reports of the whip, wielded mightily by the hands of Barter. A scream that was half human, half animal, was the result of the lashing. Bentley cringed as he imagined the bite of that lash, which he himself had experienced but a few moments before. Professor Barter! Professor Barter! Distinctly came the voice of Ellen Estabrook. Don't! Don't! He didn't mean anything, I am sure. He is sick. Something dreadful has happened to him. But he wouldn't really hurt me. He couldn't. Not really. Stop. Please. Don't strike him again. But the sound of the lash continued. Stop, I tell you. Ellen's voice rose to a cry of agonized entreaty. Don't strike him again. See, you've ripped his flesh until he is covered with blood. Strike me if you must strike someone, for with all my heart and soul I love him. End of section four.